Welcome to the Western Bell podcast series with talks on traditional spiritual teaching and its application in the world today. The intention of the series is to offer something useful for those who are drawn to study themselves and engage practice on the spiritual path. New talks are posted twice each month. The content of the talks is for informational purposes only and not to provide any kind of counseling, medical, or professional advice. This podcast is titled Sun, Moon, Tantra, Navigating the Ocean of Chaos and Coherence. It was given by Mary Angelon Young on Saturday, June 26, 2021, via Zoom. Angelon is a workshop leader, editor, and author of As It Is, Under the Punai Tree, The Baal Tradition, Caught in the Beloved's Petticoats, Enlightened Duality with Lee Lozowick, Krishna's Heretic Lovers, and The Art of Contemplation. If there is benefit in this talk for you, please consider sharing the link to it or writing a review on social media or on one of the podcast platforms. Angelon Young. Well, thank you for coming, everyone. Glad to be here with you. We'll see what happens tonight. I love this word coherence. I was recently watching a, a documentary, and for some reason, at some point in the documentary, there was a visual image that they were making the point between total like, random chaos and coherence. And so you're looking at the screen and seeing hundreds, it's like a quantum field, hundreds of points of light, and they're just pinging off each other and going random, you know, just all over the place. And then suddenly the field begins to come into a state of coherence. And the visual image of that was just so impacting for me. And of course, it's a computer simulation, but it doesn't matter. It was still very powerful to see that and to take that in what it is to be in coherence. So I'm going to begin tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about what Tantra is and a little tiny bit of historical perspective about Tantra. But I want to begin with asking you, when you hear the word Tantra, what's the first thing you think of? Anybody, you can unmute yourself and just jump in. Tantra, what's the first thing you think of? Uncensored, if, if at all possible. First thing I think of is sex. That was the word that I associated with it. Right. Thank you. Anybody else? I think of the utilization of the, the body and senses as, as being part of the spiritual path rather than rejecting, you know, the organic or whatever. Okay, great. Thank you. And the graveyards. I really like that. That's wonderful. Graveyards. So just a little bit of historical background about Tantra, because you know it's as old as the hills. Even though most scholars say it first showed up about 2,000 years ago, actually Tantra has been around forever. Because it's really a part of the basic human wisdom that's carried in the human body and within the human experience itself. So all indigenous cultures and tribal cultures, they've got their version of Tantra. It's not going to look like Hindu or Buddhist Tantra. It's going to look really much more simplified or it's, it's put into a different mythic perspective. But it's still, the principles are still the same. So I'm going to come back to the a little bit more historical perspective. But I want to talk for just a moment about how all of the major religions of the world, West and East, they're telling us we're getting this message either directly, straight up, or underneath, kind of underneath everything, that we will need to renounce our senses. We will need to renounce the body and renounce our desires and our instincts and the whole physical realm in order to relieve our suffering, to escape from suffering. And so we've got this whole kind of salvation I've got to get away from this earth and all of the troubles of this earth. And, and that may be even stronger than ever in some ways for us right now, because things are so incredibly challenging and difficult. And there's so much dukkha, a word you'll hear me 
say tonight a number of times, it's a Sanskrit word, and it means basically suffering. There's so much dukkha in the world today. So more than ever, we need to find ways to be able to work with that dukkha. But all of these sort of like rapture philosophies where we're going to get perfection, we're going to escape and you know into some heaven realm, we're going to get salvation, uh, we're going to transcend this world and, and leave this behind, we're going to get off the wheel of rebirth, right? I've been enjoying this contemporary philosopher, Jamie Wheel, and his new book, which is titled Recapture the Rapture. And it's like rethinking God, sex, and death in a world that's lost its mind. So we've got these religious, uh, deep, deep, deep programmings that go back thousands of years, especially the last 2,000 years, that are telling us that we need to get away from the body and away from the earth and away from the senses. You know, desire is endless. I vow to conquer it all. You know, this quote, I'm not saying that I vow to conquer it all because I do not. And this because I'm committed to the tantric path. But this is underneath our religious training and religious indoctrination. And to a great degree, this kind of philosophy has contributed to the situation that we're in on the earth today, where there's this vast chasm between human beings and the earth itself. So this is going to be a thread, a theme that that I will develop and keep going with as the talk goes on. And another thread or theme that, that I'm going to play with some tonight, and you're all familiar with this, those of you who've heard me speak before, is this particular pair of opposites. We'll talk about a number of pairs of opposites, but samsara versus nirvana. Samsara is the world of illusion, the phenomenal world, the world of phenomena of the five senses of nature, of everything that's embodied and incarnated. And nirvana is the heaven realm where we're going to go, where we're not going to have any suffering. So this idea, samsara is the cycle of uncontrolled rebirth or experience in the phenomenal world that's characterized by dukkha or suffering. And nirvana is the end of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the cessation of the cycle of rebirth. So we go to nirvana. Again, this is like a rapture philosophy. And I I like this phrase a lot. It speaks to me. It works for me. Or we're pursuing salvation, whether it's through Jesus or it's a transactional relationship with Jesus or a transactional relationship with a guru or a teacher a savior, somebody who's going to save us from our suffering and relieve us from our suffering. And through that process, we'll be transported to the heaven realm, whether it's Vaikuntha or the Christian heaven or any one of the number of Buddhist pure land and all of that sort of thing. Realizing non-dual rapture, Advaita Vedanta. And I mean, these are beautiful systems and I don't mean to diss them. They have a lot to offer us and a lot of beauty in them and a lot of truth in them. However, even in Gurdjieff's fourth way teachings, his teaching about feeding the sun rather than feeding the moon, Gurdjieff himself may not have meant it this way, but it's very often interpreted this way. Here is yet another situation where we're going to escape the reality in which we find ourselves. We're going to the sun as a symbol of the absolute rather than the moon, a symbol of creation. So here we have a lot of problems now on planet Earth, being separate from our felt perception, our senses, our uh, our sense awareness, our deep feeling, our radical knowing of what is true, our place in the scheme of great nature. This is such a huge reality that we're up against that human beings and the human species has really lost touch with its place in the cosmos and its place on planet Earth as a citizen on this planet, in this solar system, in this galaxy, in this universe. We have run as fast as we could for a a couple of centuries now away from really working with the matrix that we find ourselves embedded in, in human life here on Earth. So 
back to the historical perspective. So as I was saying, um, most scholars say that Tantra started showing up about 2,000 years ago, although many of the sages will tell us it's been around since the beginning of humankind. As I was saying, it's just like embedded in indigenous culture. But about 2,000 years ago, it started appearing in new forms. It was like a new emergence of it in a way. And of course, it was oral tradition for a long time. And it was another 300 years or so before some of the sutras and scriptures started getting written down. But it arose both in Buddhist Tantra and in Hindu Tantra. It arose out of a deep need that people had to find their way back to a direct experience, an empowered experience within the human being, within the individual human being, a direct experience of reality as it is, a numinous experience, an experience of grace, however we want to put that, lots of different ways to talk about it, the ecstasy, the rapture of being alive. Joseph Campbell, near the end of his life, he said, human beings aren't really looking for meaning. He said, it's not really about meaning. I'm not sure I agree with him about that part, but I like the second part of this. He said, what human beings really want is an experience of the rapture of being alive. And for me, this is what Tantra is about. This is the general uh, perspective that I'm bringing to Um, how we can bring Tantra into our ordinary lives as ordinary human beings. So these different emerging waves of Tantric practice and Tantric understanding and wisdom and insight and deep revelation that started really picking up in both Buddhism and and in Hinduism, it was a response to oppressive religious structures, a response to the Vedic traditions in which, again, there's much beauty there and incredible wisdom and revelation there. So we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but realizing that even still today, there are places in India where if you are low caste, you are not allowed in the temple to worship your Ishta Devata, your chosen deity. Or if you don't have enough money to pay for the ritual, then you don't get the prayers made because the prayers have to go through the Brahmin priests. So this is an oppressive situation for a whole lot of people. So we can understand why Tantra appealed to the masses, to misfits of culture and society. It appealed to radicals, revolutionaries, and all kinds of wonderful people that we can identify with, ordinary people as well. So Tantra poses this question for us. Do we have to abandon our earthly existence, the body and pleasure in order to realize the bliss of the self? This is a burning question of Tantra. Do we have to go through religions, creeds, sex, S-E-C-T-S, cults, priests, and dogma? Do we have to do that? Or can we go direct? Can we go directly to the supreme reality, to ultimate reality, to taste the nectar of the present moment here and now? So just a little bit more on the history of Tantra. The Buddhist Tantra developed very quickly in India around 2,000, 1,500, 1,000 years ago in that time period, 700 current era. And One of the things that comes out of Buddhist Tantra is that one of the key words of Tantra is continuity. So someone was saying that Tantra, it comes from this root word, T-A-N, Tan, in the Sanskrit language, which means a loom, as in, you know, that you would thread a loom to stretch threads across a loom and then weave a fabric so everything's connected. There is continuity between the beginning and the end. There's continuity between heaven and earth, actually. And so this idea of continuity brings us into this non-rejection. So as most of you all know, before we've actually studied or educated ourselves about Tantra, in the popular Western um, understanding, the first leap of association is with sex. And the only connection that it has to sex, I mean, definitely there are sexual yogas, Uh, that exist in Tantra, 
But the connection is because there's continuity, because there's non-rejection. So someone could be a very powerful tantric practitioner and not be having sex at all and be celibate, in fact. It's not necessary to have sex, and you might have sex. The point is that whatever it is that you're doing, it's approached from this perspective, from the perspective and the wisdom of Tantra. So somewhere along the way, Mahayana Buddhism came up with this new idea, this turning of the wheel of the Buddha Dharma, which if you study Buddhism, you know that there were different turnings of the wheel of Buddha's revelation and his teaching. And this particular turning of the wheel comes through Mahayana Buddhism. And the teaching is, this is really different than what we were talking about at the beginning. The teaching is samsara equals nirvana. Nirvana equals samsara. So what this is saying, this is radical. This is saying that the phenomenal world is co-essential with the transcendent reality, that they are co-emerging, that they exist together as a continuity. They're continuous. You can't separate them out. This is actually really good news for those of us who are on planet Earth. So if the phenomenal world, if the world of the senses and the world of the earth plane and the five elements and all of that is co-essential and co-emerging with the transcendental sat, chit, ananda, being consciousness, bliss, then enlightenment, self-realization, this is not a matter of leaving the world or killing or repressing or denying our natural instincts, our feelings, our felt awareness, our body awareness, our gut wisdom, when we can get in touch with it, what my gut is telling me. Essentially, samsara equals nirvana, nirvana equals samsara is saying that phenomena and the ultimate reality have the same nature. So when we start talking about this, nirvana equals samsara, samsara equals nirvana, and we begin to envision or explore the possibility that great nature is co-emerging and coalescing with ultimate reality. This is why I title this talk, Sun, Moon, Tantra, because the sun and the moon, which I'll talk about more a little later, are wonderful symbols for this. The sun is a typical, a classic kind of universal Western symbol for the ultimate, for the absolute, the moon for embodied creation. So we can begin to bring our awareness to this. And this is really at the crux of what Tantra is, is this a cultivation of awareness in the moment so that we are aware of the unified fabric of all of life, even while we're also participating in the particulars of who we are as created beings and all of the details of our lives. And in that marriage of opposites, the more creativity, the more awareness, the more gratitude, the more being presence, the more evolution can be true of us. And the more we're able to serve, of course, the more we're able to serve life because it's no accident that it was the Mahayana part of Buddhism that came up with this idea. Samsara equals Nirvana, Nirvana equals Samsara. Because if we love life and we love what's happening here, If we have deep love, if our hearts are open to this, then we will serve and we will serve all beings who are in a process of becoming. So we could call this the marriage of the sun and the moon. And and my teacher, Lee Lozowick, he called this enlightened duality. And he referred to this pair of opposites of non-duality, the realization of non-duality or the absolute and enlightened duality. He spoke of this as first we need to root ourselves in the truth of the unity of all of life. And then when we are rooted in that, which doesn't mean we're going to be in some kind of a enlightened heaven place or nirvana all the time. It just means that we have what we could call majority vote, that we've recognized deeply the truth that all of life is unified and that there's only one and that oneness is true of creation. That once we are there, then we can begin to bring our attention to this possibility of enlightened duality. As a very beautiful teaching, and I'm going to make a couple of 
little advertisements tonight. And so right now I'll advertise a book titled Enlightened Duality. I don't remember the subtitle. It has a long subtitle. It's by Lee Lazowick and his um, disciple, Elm Young. And that's me, actually. So, so Lee and I wrote that book together. Actually, I wrote the book, but I took the least part of it. I uh, took his transcripts and I made essays out of them. That's this book here. The subtitle is Essays on Art, Beauty, Life, and Reality as It Is. So Lee's teaching of enlightened duality, which is very beautiful, and his teachings on assertion, which contains both the realization of non-duality and enlightened duality, are um, deeply explored in that book, both from Lee's perspective and in Lee's words and, and from my perspective as the practitioner. Okay, that's my first advertisement. Oh, yes, I want to make a little plug right here for another one of the keynotes of Tantra is integration. So this principle of integration goes hand in hand with the principle of continuity and non-rejection. The integration of the, here's another pair of opposites, the little self, this small identity that we have, and the big self, the big self that's connected to all the other big selves, the self that's referred to when we hear the word self-realization. The integration between those two, the integration of bodily existence within the more subtle realities, spirit and matter, masculine and feminine. So I'm going to read you a little quote here. This is from Ananda Kumaraswamy. He says, the last achievement on the spiritual path is a recognition of the identity of spirit and matter, subject and object. This reunion is the marriage of heaven and hell, the reaching out of a contracted universe toward its freedom in response to the love of eternity for the productions of time. Then there is no sacred or profane, no spiritual or sensual, but everything that lives is pure and void. This very world of birth and death is also the great abyss. And when he's speaking of the great abyss and void and all of this, I like the Buddhist way of describing this, that it's not that it's empty as in meaningless in a kind of nihilistic way, but that it's a radiant emptiness, that creation is continually happening out of that. So even though Tantra is this beautiful, vibrant, eclectic tradition, and it is synthesized many different elements, and it really speaks to the ordinary individual person who's not necessarily going to be practicing the, the asceticism, say, of Advaita Vedanta or some other spiritual paths. It also has, over the years, developed a lot of techniques and practices that are important, very important. One of the most foundation-level elements that pervades throughout all of these practices is the is the worship of the goddess and the reclaiming of the feminine dimension and bringing back in the body the senses the connection between everything relationship so over time tantra does have a very highly ritualized side it can and brings into play very complex yogas of breath of sexuality of visualization mantra asana, sexual practice, all of these things can be found in Tantra. And all of these are very technique and, and in a way goal-oriented because Tantra also asks us the question, can we accelerate our personal evolution on the spiritual path? And this is where we get into the dangerous part of Tantra. It can be very dangerous because we do accelerate it. We engage these practices. And this is also why we will hear countless warnings of don't engage tantra if you don't have a qualified legitimate guide guru someone who has gone farther than you who has the virtue and the integrity and the revelation to guide you because once we start opening all of these deep potentials within ourselves we start opening the doors to these it can be very very destabilizing 
And so it's really important that we keep it simple unless we're working with a, a guru or a guide. And even then, there aren't any guarantees. You know, I really like what Jamie Wheel says about Tantra. He says, it's Tantra is like um, extreme sports. It's like big wave surfing and climbing the Himalayas. The falls are steep and you can kill yourself or wound yourself or cause problems for yourself that you will never recover from. So for me, I look at this and my teacher now has been dead for 10 years, dead, physically dead. He's very much alive for me. Uh, in a very big and wonderful and beautiful way. He's very much alive for me. But I'm looking at what is it about Tantra now that I can make use of because, and, and for people who don't have a teacher, and in these times when the guru principle is really, really going through a lot because so many gurus who seem to have tremendous potential or who gave fabulous teachings and did tremendous work, then things come out later about sexual abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse. The group principle is having to go through a lot of change and growth and evolution. If it's an archetypal energy, it's an archetypal function. So even if we decide we want to engage Tantra with a teacher or a guru, We've got to be very careful about who we engage and have we checked them out. Lee used to say, he used to advise people on this. He would say, you should verify for yourself everything that your teacher or your guru says. You should carefully watch your guru and test that person for their authenticity and their genuineness and their virtue. He didn't use that word, but I'm going to use it because I think it it really hits the mark. Are they virtuous? It doesn't mean they're perfect human beings, nobody's perfect. Nobody, even the greatest sage is not perfect. But do they have virtue? And are they really rooted in the spiritual path? So if we do get involved with a teacher, then we're going to bring on a whole other cascade of very sticky situations and entanglements with spiritual authority and everything that that involves. That's not what this talk is about. What I would like to talk about now is we go from method, which is all of these like complicated pranayama, complicated sexual yogas, 100,000 prostrations or visualizations and endless mantra repetitions. And we're seeking this ecstatic experience of life. So maybe there are other ways that we can engage this kind of a process where we can engage the question, can I accelerate my spiritual development, my spiritual evolution in a way that is sane, given what life is like here on planet Earth now? So now we're moving into the second part of my talk. (laughs) I want to just mention the bowels of Bengal real quickly. The Bowels are a sect, a 500-year-old sect. They originated in Bengal, and they came out of this much older sect that were both Buddhist and Hindu. There were Buddhist Sahajiyas and Hindu Sahajiyas. And the Sahajiyas are called that because they follow the Sahaj way. And Sahaj is a Sanskrit word that means primordial, natural, simple, spontaneous. And sometimes it's used to to say it's the easy way, it's the easy path, but it's not easy because it's easy as we think of easy. It's easy because of its its simplicity and its naturalness and because it seeks to completely empower the potential that is lying dormant within every human being as our birthright. We're already born with it. It's innate. Innate is another one of the words that's used to define this beautiful word, Sahaja. So Sahaja, it's the essence of simplicity and trust in the sacred nature of life itself and in this deep now, this present moment right now. And the Bowels, this uh, sect, S-E-C-T, this cult of the Bowels, they grew out of these more ancient cults called the Sahajiya. So now we'll have my second advertisement. Here's my second advertisement. This is a book of historical fiction, Krishna's Heretic Lovers, by me, Mary Angeline Young. And this is a book about 
these very, very early bowls who were emerging out of the Sahajia movement. And one in particular is a true story about an amazing poet and realizer and lover of life, Chandi Das, and his low caste lover, Rami. It's the story of Chandi Das and Rami. And when I was writing this book, I so fell in love with the story of Chandi Das and Rami as historical characters and all of his poetry. If you ever have a chance to read the poetry of Chandi Das, I recommend it. But he is a great example of a life lived in this Sahajiya mode, this way of Sahajiya. When we breathe, the divine is breathing us. When we sing, we are being sung by life. When we make love, we are that. We're not separate from it and thinking about it. So this is really leaning more toward magic, although the bowels do have many, many very powerful techniques and they're incredible, accomplished yogis and yoginis. The ones that I've met, the Shanatan Baba Baul, he was still doing headstands when he was 90 years old. Gore Kepa, incredible yogi, his asana practice. And of course, they were involved in sexual yoga, all of them as well. Parvati Baul, who's in her 40s now, she's a wonderful friend and just an incredible example of the bowl spirit, bowl culture, bowl practice, tradition, and this magic that comes through because the bowls encode all of their teaching in their art, in the beauty of their poetry and their song and their dance. And she's a wonderful, wonderful living embodiment of that. So I have to just speak to who the bowls are, first of all, before we go on to demystifying Tantra, because they have managed to bring the magic and keep the method and the the disciplines of the practice, keep those imbued with the deeper magic. Really, it's when teachings and practices and scripture and all these kinds of things, when these lose the magic, they become dead and stultifying and they no longer feed us or serve us. They have to be alive. The Baals have a saying, they're looking for direct experience, direct relationship with the divine. And they use these two words, Bartaman and Anuman. And they say that all scripture, as wonderful as it is, as important as it is, as much as we need it, yes, take it in. But at some point, we have to understand that it is what they call gossip. It's Anuman. It's gossip. It's hearsay. It's somebody else's revelation. It's not your revelation. It's not my revelation. So they're seeking Bartaman, which is this direct experience. It's not mediated by anyone else. And this is essential Tantra. So that brings us to this possibility of demystifying all of these very esoteric teachings of Tantra and also the possibility that we can engage a Tantric perspective and approach to our lives in a way of seeing and experiencing life without destabilizing ourselves with a lot of practices that are forcing a kind of evolutionary edge that perhaps we're not ready for, or that we don't have someone to guide us when we get into deep water. So what are some of the ways that we can bring essential tantric perspective into embodiment now, into our lives now, bring some of the vital and really benevolent elements of Tantra into our daily lives. Most of us, we're just so busy just trying to stay alive and trying to find our way through the incredible situation that we find ourselves in. After a year and a half of a global pandemic faced with accelerated climate change, political upheaval, especially and certainly in the States, culture wars, deep, deep separation and disagreement and conflict between people profound suffering, profound dukkha. How can we do this? And we begin with cultivating a moment-to-moment awareness, moment-to-moment awareness within ourselves. Because what we have to work with is ourselves. I have to work with me. I was just hearing from a friend of mine recently. He keeps reminding his friends to pay attention to your own business. What someone else is doing is not your business, including if they're doing things that upset you and you wish they wouldn't do them. 
my business in that situation is attending to me. So beginning with cultivating moment-to-moment awareness, which ultimately will bring us to this really being in love with life. And I know for myself, despite all of this that's going on, it's like the worst it gets out there in the world. And I say out there, but it's in here. Uh, It's not separate from me. The worst it gets in terms of all of the anxiety and fear and depression that's been unleashed within our cultures, East and West, with pandemics, with the incredible instability of life, not knowing if the human species, if we're even going to continue here after another hundred years. The more this is going on, the more I fall in love with life and the more beauty I see in nature and the more I'm aware of how life is communicating to me every day. Yes, through my dreams, definitely, that through, through the dream, but through the symbolism and the synchronicity and the coincidence or even just the beauty of the rhythms of nature, the sunrise, the sunset, the rhythms of the moon, the cycles of the moon. And this is something that happens to us in the tantric path. I'm not talking now about the tantric path in terms of any kind of definition through the Hindu tradition of Tantra or the Buddhist tradition of Tantra, but about how Tantra is present for us as ordinary postmodern human beings living on planet Earth. That it's actually very, very available to us. And I, I just want to make a little plug here. I often will bring in some of the teachings of C.G. Jung, one of my teachers in this life, and his work has continued to be of such incredible benefit to me. So I want to just speak a little bit about these pairs of opposites that we have within our lives that we struggle with. Maybe we struggle with wanting peace versus having inner conflict. Maybe we struggle with a decision and there's a pair of opposites there. Should I go or should I stay? Should I get this treatment for my health or should I not do that treatment? Should I tell my friend? Should I give my friend the feedback or should I just work with it within myself? Do you know what I'm talking about? About these pairs of opposites within? So one of the ways that we can build awareness is by bringing our attention to those pairs of opposites that are at play within us and in our lives. And sometimes they show up as, you know, self and other or, you know, what's going on inside here and what's going on out there. Sometimes it's all in here. We bring our attention to this and we stay in the tension between the pairs of opposites and not try to do something at first, not try to force a resolution, but to just wait and stay with the tension between the opposites. Stay and wait. What will happen is what Jung called the transcendent function, a third force in uh, almost all of the great teachings. There, this, this law of three creation, preservation, destruction. In the Celtic tradition, it's called the Trishkalian. It's also creation, preservation, and and destruction. This third, unexpected, unbidden, we didn't ask for it. We didn't ask for anything. We're just staying with the tension of the opposites and not acting on them yet, not trying to make a decision or resolve it. That third thing will come in, and it's graceful. It's unexpected. It somehow will, at least for the moment, resolve the tension and something new becomes possible. So all of these polarities in our lives, these things that we struggle with, should I retire or should I keep working, for example? That's a big one. I've lived on an ashram for 30 years. I don't see any retirement anywhere in the future, you know, things have changed. Definitely. I can't write for 12 hours a day, for example, like I used to. So there's lots of different pairs of opposites that we struggle with. But all of those polarities have within them this hidden secret movement toward wholeness, back to this idea of integration, that we're integrating, that we're not rejecting. We're not saying no to, we're integrating, we're bringing it into awareness. We're bringing into our attention so that we continue to expand. This is an expansive process because we get bigger and bigger and bigger and more able to hold and contain 
all of these processes of life and alchemical process, which is what the polarities are all about. It's an alchemical process. So between the two opposites, there's this golden mean, we could say, a graceful emergence of something new that can happen. Anybody have any questions? I have a question. This idea of polarities and the yes and no and back and forth and should I or should I not, all of that, I'm hearing it from a new perspective tonight, which I really like. But I've also heard that that actual almost neurotic inability to answer the question, yes, no, should I, should I not, and the recurring thoughts that gather around that consideration could be actually more of an entity, you know, kind of getting in the way of something. What would you say about that? You know, like a compulsive not being present sort of situation. Do you know what I'm speaking about? When it becomes, I guess, so painful that the back and forth is hurting, you know, that it's it's a form of suffering. Well, it is a suffering. Yeah. It most definitely is suffering. And in the staying with it, we become present to our suffering. And becoming present to our suffering increases our awareness. And the more aware we become, the more we will be moved toward our own growth. It is a suffering. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I experience. It can be very painful. And that's why we want out of it. And we'll do almost anything just to get out of it. We'll go to addiction. We'll go to obsession. We'll go to compulsion. But if we stay with it and we bring awareness to it, then we're building a capacity within ourselves to know who we are and to be honest and truthful with ourselves about the process. I'm going to talk about some things that we can do. I'm going into some practical things that are coming next here. I think that all of us who are here, we're here tonight because we feel an urgency. We feel an urgency. We're aware that transformation is possible. Up until our last breath in this life, transformation is possible. And then there's the big transformation of the moment of death. I want to just say something about another little piece of Jungian material, which is another continuity between the ego self, the small self, the egoic identity, and the deep self. That this too is a continuity. It's an axis. There's an ego self axis. And the inner work that we need to do of becoming present to this and working with this, this is essential, the self-honesty that I just mentioned of being real with ourselves. One of the things that I, I want to mention right here in terms of this inner work that we have to do in order to cultivate awareness and to become aware of our awareness so that we are present in the moment and we're present in the moment even to these pairs of opposites. They're going to break in on us. I'm I'm here enjoying the sunset. I'm being present to the moment, but then all of a sudden, all my worries about this thing show up again. And I have to be present to that because now it's here. It's so important that we don't allow ourselves to get stuck anywhere along the way. And we can be very, very stuck. And we're all stuck in some places. So, you know, of course, we all have obstacles and we have areas of ourselves where we just haven't been able to penetrate through and bring awareness, bring the light and the fresh air of our attention and our awareness to that and to really bring consciousness to it and to integrate it into ourselves so that it's not hidden from us and operating in a shadowy way. So if I say don't get stuck, I don't mean, okay, we could all, I mean, ideally, yes, we could all be free flowing and have no obstacles at all at any time. But probably we wouldn't even have taken birth here because this is our school. This is where we come for transformation. The possibility, the human potential here is so huge. And so all of our obstacles and our stuckness, this is our doorway, our window in. And this is an essential tantric perspective rather than, oh, why am I like this? Why can't I resolve that? Why do I have this obstacle? Why did I do that again, 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 again? Well, this is my moment for practice. Even if just in the moment, bring enough awareness to it and my struggle with it that we might even experience, as we do in meditation, we might experience its emptiness, that it's a radiant void. 
of course, it will probably come back because that's human life. But those things are our windows into practice. So cultivating awareness. And the second thing I want to suggest is like keeping it simple, doing what is obviously good for us. What is benevolent, virtuous, builds virtue. And by virtue, I'm not talking about morality. I'm talking about really that which serves life. Doing what is obvious. So here's my list for today of doing what is obvious. It might be different on some other day. I might add some other things or you make your own list. I recommend it. Let's start with this one. Sleep deeply. Get rest every night if you can. And if you're not getting it, inquire about that. Look into that. What's going on? Sleep deeply. Move frequently. However that is for you, whether that's a daily walk or asana practice or exercise, work out at the gym, move frequently or just getting up and moving around. If you've been at the computer for, for two hours or even 30 minutes, moving around a little bit, dancing, going outside for a breath of fresh air and just moving, move frequently. The third one is eat real food, get outside. I'm going to come back to that one. Here's an interesting one. Bathe often. You know, I was raised in the Christian tradition. I got a lot from that. I was going to say beautiful stories. Some of them are really horrible stories, but <laughs> like Abraham and Isaac, I guess it ends well. So it was not one of my favorite Bible stories. I couldn't understand why God would ever even suggest or even think of asking Abraham to kill his firstborn son. I didn't get that. I still don't. But <laughs> anyway, in the Christian tradition, one of the things that I heard a lot was cleanliness is next to godliness. And I think there's something to this, not from this like moralistic perspective or this, this like puritanical perspective, but from the perspective of the treasuring of the human body, that we treasure this body and this vessel. In the same way that we might embellish it with beautiful things, like if you're a woman, jewelry, or if you're a man and you're like jewelry, I think it's great when men wear jewelry. I love it. Most of you don't do it, I've noticed. But um, <laughs> um, but there's something about treasuring the vessel. And so bathing often can be a way of relating with the water element, of staying in touch with our own nature, of being intimate with ourselves, just the physical contact with ourselves and the gift of the human form. Okay, here's another one. Play music, listen to music, sing. And in general, I would say be creative. But music has a particular place in there. I'll come back to be creative. So play music, listen to music, sing. Have music in your life somehow. Breathe with awareness. There's these two different breaths that have really, they've been getting a lot more attention. They're very simple breaths that you can do. One of them is, it's a breath that you engage if you have anxiety and fear. It was made popular through the, do you know this breath? No, I, I know anxiety and fear. You do know anxiety and fear. Anybody else have any anxiety and fear? Occasional anxiety and fear, like maybe a few times a day. So this is a really simple breath process that you can engage and you cannot hurt yourself doing this. This is not a pranayama where you can have some kind of huge kundalini experience that you might not ever recover from. It's not like that. Okay, this is a simple, basic breath. I like to call it a four-beat breath, but some, uh, like the Navy SEALs, they call it the box breath, and they use it to work with anxiety or panic or fear or extreme states or emotional states. And basically, you breathe in for four beats or four counts to a count of four. You hold for four, then you breathe out for four, and you hold for four. So let's just try that for a minute. You breathe in for four beats. If you're not sitting up, sit up a little bit straight and be comfortable. And just let's just breathe for a minute. Breathe in for four beats. And then hold for four beats. And then breathe out for four beats. 
and hold for four beats. Now let's just do that in quiet. Okay, just breathe naturally. Anybody notice anything in doing this? Well, for me, it really regulates the nervous system. Uh, yes, Angela, and it is calming. And by the way, there's a book called Breathe. Everything you think you know about breathing, it's very fascinating. I forget the author. I was just going to mention this book. It's wonderful. You know, it does help stimulate the vagus nerve. And if you do it a little bit longer, then your mind may wander and you come back. You just gently and in a way of, you know, being kind and compassionate with yourself, just bring yourself back to the breath. It can be very, very benevolent. And this book, actually, I write about it in my new book. This is my third and last advertisement. I have a new book out, which is titled The Art of Contemplation. And a lot of these things that we're talking about I think you you might find some things in there that would be useful to you. The Art of Contemplation available through Home Press and also available through Amazon and all of those kinds of things. So this is one of the breaths that you can do. It just slows you down, if nothing else. It's almost a little bit of a timeout, just slows things down. We get to the point where we're speeding so fast. I know I'm still multitasking and I know very well what the negative effects are of multitasking. I do it all the time. We get to speeding so quickly and going so fast just to stop and breathe. And not necessarily the box breath, but just to stop and bring awareness to our breath. Just take a deep breath and slow down. This is powerful. This is important. And if we do it off and on all day long throughout our day, the more we do it, the more we're building awareness and more we're connecting to what is deep and real in us because the breath is like the most immediate connection to reality and to our embodiment on this plane of reality. If we stop breathing, we die. We're not here anymore. My teacher, Lee, he wrote many, many devotional poems to his master, Yogi Ramsara Kumar. And in one of those poems, he says, breathe in, Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar, breathe out, Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar. Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar was a very, very great saint and an amazing God realizer, an amazing sage and inspiration in my life and in many of our lives. And one of the gifts he gave to us, the great gift he gave to us was to repeat his name, just say his name. Because through his realization of the divine, through his God realization, his self-realization, his realization of Sat Chit Ananda, his Jivan Mukti that he had in his lifetime, his uh, complete liberation, the liberation of his awareness and his being, through his realization, when we repeat his name, we are connected to the ultimate reality and to the reality of all that is. And so that's another little piece that's been very precious for me. So I want to go back to my little list here. Breathe with awareness was the last one. There's another very simple breath that I want to mention that's not a pranayama technique, although it's a simple, simple technique that shows up throughout many different religious traditions. And it is simply consciously connected breath and about five seconds in breath and about five seconds out breath. And this too, you'll find in the book, breath. But the in breath and the out breath are connected. You don't stop in between. You don't stop and count like four beats like we did with the four beat breath. It's just a consciously connected breath. So this is something that everybody can do and anybody can do to bring immediate presence of being, to bring us into the present moment at least more than we were before, to slow us down a little bit, to get us connected with reality. Here's another one, grieve fully. So many of us, we have lots of reasons to grieve. We've lost loved ones. We've perhaps had traumatic experiences in our lives. 
that everybody is grieving, whether we admit it or not. Everyone is grieving the loss of the world as we have known it. It is not going back to the way it was. And just bringing an awareness to that is a very powerful piece of inner work and allowing ourselves to be present to it and whatever that might bring up. It might bring up anxiety. It might bring up sorrow. It might bring up heartbreak. It might bring up a deep, deep calling to serve in some way. Being willing to grieve fully is very connected. It's a little more specific, but it's very connected to being willing to feel fully. And that's a whole talk. It's another one of my favorite themes. Here's another thing. If you're in a couple relationship, make love. Give thanks. Be grateful. Find the things that you're grateful for. Even if you're angry, upset, resentful, and a whole bunch of other things, you can still find something to be grateful about. And sometimes we tell ourselves, I can't be grateful because I'm all of these other things. I'm too full of anger. I'm too full of this. And that's really not true. In this principle of continuity, things can happen all at the same time. We can be sad and joyful at the same time. I've noticed, and I'm sure some of you have too, that we can be very sad. We can even be depressed and suddenly some little well of joy bubbles up inside of us. And then I have be creative. Be creative in whatever way you can be creative. Be creative when you cook. Be creative when you hum a little tune. Be creative if you are drawn to the arts, if you want to draw, sculpt, sing, play a musical instrument. It's never too late. It's never too late to be creative. It's never too late to start learning a musical instrument if you want to. It's a great thing to do. Be creative. Write. One of my favorite forms of creativity. I love music and the piano and the ektara. And I love the harp. I don't play the harp, but I love it very, very much. So what do you love? What do you love? Go toward it. Pay attention to nature. Pay attention to the cycles of the moon. Gaze at the sky. Attune yourself to the rhythms of the solar system, which you can do by paying attention to the moon. That helps a lot. Be in relationship with the deity of the sun. You know, for the ancients, the sun and the moon, these are deities. And they are deities. And I think there's really something to that the sun is a conscious being that all of the suns and all of the universes are conscious beings. This sun worship, this has been around forever in all indigenous cultures and in great complex religious traditions like in Hinduism. The worship of the sun goes back thousands and thousands of years. So we can just simply love the sun, be aware of the sun, be aware of how the sun is giving us life. Give thanks to the sun. That's not so easy to do sometimes when you live in the high desert like me or when we're having fires all over the place, which we've had and we're still having. It's a very powerful time. Even in the face of adversity, being grateful and expressing gratitude is a powerful, powerful affirmation, a powerful way to be in love with life, a powerful way to let the principles of Tantra work on us alchemically in a mysterious way. I'm going to move on now to another one of the things that we can do. This is an interesting piece. Do the hard thing that's in front of you. Some of the Tantric cults, the sects like the Agoris, for example, they meditate in the Smashan. They go to the cremation grounds and they meditate on corpses or they sit in the grounds and they meditate on impermanence and the nature of reality and death and birth and all of these powerful primordial realities. But we're not going to be doing that. Most of us are not going to be going to the smashan and meditating to transcend our fear and our suffering and our revulsion and all of that. But what we can do is we can face up to the hard painful, difficult things that face us in our everyday lives. We can attend to those things that have our name on them that are arising 
around us, whether it's caring for someone who's dying, being there for a friend, or it's just, it could be anything. It could even be cleaning the house. But what is arising in your personal sphere? It may be a thing you really don't want to do, and you don't even know why you have to do it. But somehow it arrives at your door, and it has your name on it. Do that. Do that thing. That's Tantra. And know that it's sacred that you're doing it. Be aware that it's sacred that you're doing it. It needs to be done. And it's connected somehow to your personal dharma, your sva dharma, the dharma that's unique to you, to me, to each one of us. We all have our dharma, the sva dharma, is completely aligned with the big dharma, cosmic reality. So when we do this, when we do what is wanted and needed, which is a way that Werner Earhart, who is a contemporary spiritual teacher, he uses this phrase, used this phrase, do what is wanted and needed. When we do that, we align with the cosmos, literally, and it opens up a tremendous amount of energy. Prana starts flowing and we gain clarity when we can face what life is asking us to face. Here's another one. Let the mystery be the mystery. Don't try to understand many things. You cannot understand. Just let it be a mystery and appreciate it that it is the great mystery and it is a great mystery. This involves a lot of letting go of concepts. And this is very fruitful practice, always, endlessly. Letting go of concepts, letting go of our personal identifications. Letting go of our story, opening to the unknown, and being true to ourselves. That's the next one on my list. Be true to yourself. And this, of course, has to grow out of that foundation of self-inquiry and self-honesty and radical self-honesty. Or we're not being true to ourselves because we think we're being true to ourselves because we're following the mandates of our little self. But the little self has such a tiny picture of reality and what our purpose is and what life is, such a really limited view. So being true to yourself is a much, much bigger view. And in that, we're going to have to approach the unknown and dance with it and play with it. Or we'll never find out what it means to be true to ourselves. And then the death and rebirth practice, which is very essential to Tantra. And there are really traditional visualizations for dissolving the five elements and all this kind of thing. I'm not going to talk about that. But in our ordinary lives, we can contemplate the reality that we are going to die and that we're going to, in fact, lose everyone and everything before it's over. So here's a quote from Jamie Wheel, W-H-E-A-L. What if we practiced dying to our stories, our pain, and our pleasures, dying to our rightness, dying to our wrongness, dying every moment, and living into the deep now? See who you would be on the other side. So this is essential tantric practice, and it's every day. All the time, moment to moment, doesn't matter what age you are, if you're 32 or you're 72 or 82, it doesn't matter. And I say this a lot to my beloveds and loved ones and friends who are a lot younger than me. I say, start now. Don't wait. Start now. Because you can only do so much. And of course, the older we get, the more the reality of death, the truth of death becomes more and more poignant and more and more piercing for us, and in many ways, very fruitful. This is a very important practice. And it leads us to, it can help us to continue with our inner quest of asking ourselves the question, which is where I'd like to end, of what am I longing for? What is it I still have yet to do? Yes, I'm going to die, possibly soon, I don't really know. It could be tonight. It could be in 10 years. It could be for some of you in 40 years. Some of you, it's much closer, like me. But still, until the last breath, there is work to be done. And there is a purpose to be fulfilled. 
So what am I longing for? What is it that I love? What is calling me? What's calling me? What has my name on it? Am I looking for love in all the wrong places still? What do I love? Where is the virtue in what I love? So keep your quest going. Keep your questions going and knowing this has been such a fruitful practice for me that even though there are lots of answers and I like it when they come, the real juice is in the question. The real alchemy, the real power is in the question. And to keep questioning, to not draw conclusions about things, to allow things to be open-ended and unknown. I heard this poem recently, so I'd just like to share this one line, which is, your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. Your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. Also from a poem, it's by Theodore Ruthke. The poem appears in a book called The Rag and Bone Shop of the Heart. But this particular poem is by Rothke, and in it, he makes this statement. He says, this edge is what I have. And that's Tantra. That's essential Tantra. This edge is what I have. We're always on the verge of becoming. We're always facing the unknown. We're practicing with impermanence, with death, with beauty. We're letting beauty and impermanence swirl around us in this incredible dance. We're in love with life, and that is an edge. And in this time, in these days, it's really an edge to be in love with life because the heartbreak is so deep 